gentle into that good night. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. In the first video, we established that an essential human quality is the understanding of eternity, that timeline that is before and after us, that there is an, a sort of permanence to everything. You had to be taught, though, early on, sometime in your life, whether it was the death of a beloved pet, or a character on TV, or most tragically, a loved one, what death was. It wasn't something that you were born understanding. You might have understood that there was a time before you, but you never really thought about there being a time after you. It was something that someone explained to you. And so that moment when we sort of step off the timeline is death. And ever since we discovered it, we've been trying to find ways to avoid it. And so ever since then, regardless of how gently or roughly you acquired the knowledge of death, you have been avoiding it with varying degrees of caution. Now a scientific study entitled, Would the Average Person Rather Be Alive or Dead? is probably not a study that actually needs to happen, but people make these studies all the time anyway. And so it should come as no surprise that shrewd purveyors of snake oil and magic potions have been peddling the promise of eternal life for millennia. Why then should we accept today's technology's promise of immortality with any less amounts of skepticism? We shouldn't, of course. The practical and ethical, saying nothing of religious implications, are easily the most significant in all of human history. If it is possible to extend our lifespans indefinitely, and science shows us that it should be, the manner in which we approach such a technology should be cautiously skeptical, almost to the point of incredulity. Now, no new technology can render us safe from all harm. I'm not talking about superhero-like immunity from bullets and fiery explosions and all that. What I mean by immortality is halting of the natural processes which lead to our inevitable death, so let's be specific here. Even under ideal circumstances, your chance of dying doubles every eight years after age 60. The whole thing has such a, a mystery to it and such a finality and inevitability to it that we can't help but be compelled to treat it with great reverence and respect, and we should, and yet that shouldn't prevent us from trying to understand the why of the whole thing. Why do we get older? Why does it have to come to an end? We know that there is an accumulation of cellular damage over time. Even if you live a perfect life, completely healthy, no diseases, no carcinogens, just the perfect foods and the right amounts of exercise, it's still going to happen eventually. We know that certain systems get damaged and your body has other systems in place for going around those damaged systems or even repairing it, but eventually even those systems get damaged and the accumulation of all of that damage becomes too difficult for our bodies to overcome and it just overwhelms us. We can avoid and repair the inevitable damage to our body's cells. Medicine is getting better every year at repairing unimaginable kinds of damage. Even the prognoses for various types of cancers have become quite good as our early detection methods improve. We have learned that things that we put into our bodies can do more harm than good. You've probably heard of antioxidants, but most people hear that and wonder what an oxidant is supposed to be. Alright, well without getting too nitty gritty here, your body needs oxidizing agents to do that internal chemistry that keeps you alive, but too much of anything tends to be a bad thing in your body, so pollutants and alcohol, various foods, even too much sunlight can shift the balance in your body toward an over oxidized state, which causes a continuous kind of cell damage, just like leaving something in the oven too long will continue to burn it. We've also learned that just one of the reasons obesity is so dangerous is that too much sugar in your blood over a long period of time does that same sort of damage. In fact, mice were given a calorie restricted and nutrient dense diet and were shown to live up to 50% longer than normal mice. 
No matter how well you live your life though, there is a built-in fuse to every single one of your trillions of cells slowly burning away. So even if you eat the best foods, even if you have a doctor on call, even if you haven't been sick in 20 years, you're still going to eventually kick the bucket. There's just no getting around it. See. Your cells have to divide to keep you alive. Cells die all the time for any number of reasons. And every single time they split, the DNA has to be copied. But the mechanisms that divide and copy your DNA have a built-in flaw. They cut off a little piece of the ends. And eventually, after millions of replications, that DNA starts being cut off in the useful parts that build proteins and do other things that make the cells do what they're supposed to do. Let's say we want to make a copy of our DNA in the form of these 10 pages right here. Just like regular DNA, it needs to be an exact copy. It doesn't do us any good to have most of a copy or a simulation of a copy. We need to copy it pretty much exactly in order for the instructions of the subsequent cell that we're dividing into to be as precise as possible and to actually work properly. So in order to do that, we're going to use a special kind of copy paper right here. We'll do that by moving the copy over. It makes its copy. We get some raw materials and imprint our copy on top of it just like that. And we do that for page after page, all nine of the ten pages, until a problem occurs. When we hit page nine and we start to bring over and copy our tenth page, the problem is we've hit the end of it. We've hit ten pages over here. Our copy page counts against the entire total. And so what ends up happening is the entire process stops right there before you've actually gotten to that last little bit and ends. That's it. So the new cell actually is missing a little bitty piece of the end of the DNA. And that's a problem. Your DNA has protection against this kind of information loss in the form of special end cap sections to the whole thing called telomeres. It's kind of like in our previous example of the 10 pages, if we were to just come along and add a few hundred pages to the bottom of the whole thing. That way, if you lose one, it's not too big of a deal. In fact, if you were to write out the ACTGs of your entire genetic code onto a typical book-sized paper, it would take 7,000 pages to write the entire thing, and each time the DNA is copied, you're really only losing a few letters at a time. Still, that's information loss, and given millions of copies over the course of a lifetime, you're eventually going to get to the important stuff. In January of 2015, researchers successfully employed a method of re-lengthening the telomeres of living cells in culture, in effect turning back the clock on their age and extending their lifespans pretty much indefinitely. If such a method could be applied to the living cells still inside of our body, and if our lifestyles were fine-tuned to eliminate the various unhealthy stressors as much as reasonably possible, and medicine could eliminate many of our common age-related diseases, we could extend our lifespan to unknown lengths. But why bother propping up a system which is doomed to fail eventually no matter what we do? Wouldn't it be better to create a better system, one that isn't pre-programmed to fall apart on us after a few years? Well, the problem with that is we immediately enter the dark and foreboding waters of philosophy and morality and spirituality and so rather than just dive headfirst into those waters I'm just gonna stir them up a little bit and then we'll just move on. To make you immortal we're going to have to very carefully define what you are, what constitutes you. Now I'm going to ask you a series of questions, and if you answer no to any of these questions, you might as well just stop the video there. The reason being, everything else that we've talked about applies to you, but all the rest of the stuff that we're going to talk about is going to sound like science fiction-y, hocus-pocus, snake oil, gobbledygook. Fair enough? Okay, four simple questions. We'll say I'm a mad scientist, and I decide to cut your foot off, because I need extra feet. After I cut your foot off, are you still you? Yeah, that's an easy question. All right, question two. To make up for the cutting off of the foot, I decide I'm going to replace your puny biological arms with special bionic arms. So I take off your arms, and I put on some newer, better arms than the ones that you were born with. Are you still you? Okay, still with me? All right, question three. 
Let's say in the scanning of your body, I discover that you actually have a congenital heart defect. You have a flaw in your heart, and it's going to kill you at any time. So thankfully for you, I have some extra hearts laying around because I'm a good mad scientist, and I can replace your heart, your flawed heart, with a newer, better heart, but still a human heart. Are you still you, even after I swap hearts? Okay. All right. Simple enough. All right. Final question. Me being a mad scientist and probably an evil mad scientist, I lay it down next to some other poor sucker and I decide I'm going to open your heads up and swap your brains. So I swap their brain into your skull and your, your brain into their head and I close you all back up and I'm a good mad scientist so I know how to do all of this so that it works out well. Uh, and then I wake you up. My question is, are you still you in your old body? Now wait, 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 I saw many of you reaching to stop the video with that last question, but don't, don't leave just yet. I think most of us can agree, regardless of our religious or lack of religious beliefs, that our sense of self is inextricably tied to our bodies through our brain. Many people believe there is an immeasurable quantity to the human self which transcends our biology. The name that we've given that quantity is usually soul or spirit or something else. And yet, we would still probably agree that if you swapped brains with me, your old body with my brain would not be you. Perhaps even your soul would have moved with the brain, but who knows. Spiritual implications notwithstanding. You saw in the last video, in part 3, that brain mapping is quickly coming to fruition, and that means we're going to be able to simulate a complete human brain. We could map your brain, every single neuron and connection in it, simulate it digitally, and then just boot it up. So the question is, who's that in the computer? Well, as far as every metric is concerned, it's you. You could even argue it's a better you, no longer bound by the constraints of your wetware biology. If we're honest though, that doesn't really do much to allay our fears of death, no matter how perfectly you it is in the computer, what you're trying to do is preserve the you that exists right now. So now is as good a time as any to remind you of the last video when we talked about the ship of Theseus. Soon technology is going to be able to replace your wetware neuron brain. Saying nothing for the crumbling cartilage in your knees, or the aching muscles in your back, or the sagging skin under your eyes. We could replace your brain with synthetic versions designed to last until you're ready to replace them again. So let's say we slowly replaced, perfectly mimicking your existing biology, piece by piece, neuron by neuron, eventually, over a period of time, your entire brain with hardware. And that hardware got every math question correct at the blink of an eye never forgot any piece of information regardless of time or complexity, and could process even the most abstract concepts with complete ease. Would you do it? Take a second and think about that. If not, why not? I mean, do you really want to be left behind like some steam engine in a museum somewhere? Uh, look at the antique human being with the quaint biological parts. I mean, if you don't want to extend your lifespan, I can hardly blame you, but just know that this technology is coming whether you're willing to use it or not, and it's going to change all of the human condition throughout the world. And that's it. Uh, it's been four weeks since I started this whole thing. I've been editing these things multiple times a week. Um, figuring out where to go and who to talk to and how to set things up and it's been really tough but it's also been really rewarding um, I've already got some supporters who are sending me cameras and microphones and a green screen this thing is really taking off bigger than I ever could have hoped uh, the feedback has been nothing but positive all the way along except for a few sound bites here and there uh, but for the most part uh, I'm really encouraged and I'm gonna keep doing these things even as we go into the school year my time is gonna be a little bit more more limited, so expect the movies to be da cut down uh, to three to or, uh, probably, probably about seven to eight minutes long. Um, the production value is going to keep going up. I'm going to keep learning how to do software. I just paid for After Effects uh, and Audition, so I'm going to get some fancier stuff. You probably saw a little bit of that here in this last video. Um, next week is going to be even better, and it's going to keep getting better week after week. So I hope you'll stay along for the ride, and I'll see you very soon. Take care.